Good afternoon. Welcome to Cone and Kruger. That's Larry Kruger. I'm Grant Cone. We are quickly approaching the NFL draft. It is draft season, and the Niners have a first round pick and a second round pick. And we found out who they're going to take. <laughs> there we you go. Know. So we're going to tell you. Stay tuned for that. Uh, first, though, we want to talk about the breaking news. The 49ers signed Detroit Lions backup tight end Brock Wright to an offer sheet. He's a restricted free, free agent. He signed with the Niners. The Lions now have five days to match the offer, and if they do, he stays with Detroit. What do you think will happen here, and what do you think of this potential move? Well, I mean, I think it's needed. Um, look at what they got. I mean, you I don't know what Cam Latou is. I don't know what Braden Willis is. Um, Tongues, I think, is just a, just a guy. I mean, I hate to say that because he's a local guy and he went to Cal, but um, they don't have a lot at tight end. You know, they got Kittle on the wrong side of 30. I thought they would go veteran tight end and rookie tight end. I was thinking Robert Tanyan. This is a little lesser of a player, but, um, you know, Brock Wright's interesting. I mean, I saw him at Notre Dame. Um, you know, he's he's a 6'5", 250-pound tight end who can catch the ball a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of people speculating that Wright, you know, because of his PFF numbers as far as pass blocking snaps, run blocking snaps, that he's more of a run blocker. But I don't know. I mean, I, to me, he's 6'5", 250, 260 in that range, and I think he's got decent hands. So um, we'll see what he looks like in camp. But, I, I, you know, he's a backup tight end for sure. The Lions can decide to match. I don't think they will. Um, and um, And the Niners have a veteran you know, stopgap guy that can do a little bit of everything, which is kind of what Charlie Warner was. Yeah, it seems like a big blocking tight end. That's not Braden Willis. Uh, it's it probably they were hoping it would be Cam Latu, but I'm not sure he's going to make the team. They say that he missed his rookie year because he was hurt. I I, I mean, they could have put him on IR after the final cuts and brought him back at some point, but they just shut him down for the whole year. I think they kind of just decided he wasn't good enough to make the team. And I don't see, I didn't see anything from him in terms of speed, quickness, blocking that's going to get him on the roster. So they need to replace Charlie Warner, who got a pretty nice contract with the Falcons. He was a key member of their special teams as well. Yeah. It's not supposed to be the best tight end class in the draft either. And they want someone who's strong, a grown man who can be that blocking tight end. At the same time, it's not a key role in the offense. It's a guy who plays, what, 100-plus snaps a year? And I don't think this guy's as good a blocker as Charlie Warner. I mean, I think Charlie Warner's a better blocker than this guy, but I think this guy's a better receiver than Charlie. And the offer sheet they signed him to was, what, not even $3 million? Right. It was oh. it was one year, 2.98, and then, and then if the Lions don't match <clears throat> or, you know, the Niners don't owe um, a draft choice because of that, of the, of the level of the contract, there'll be no, you know, even though the, the lines do have right of first refusal, if they decide they don't want to keep them or, you know, they, the Niners aren't giving any picks. My prediction is that the lines match. Really? Yeah. It's not that much. No, but, um, they've got a truly great young tight end there. True. So, Maybe, maybe. I mean, um, the Lions... I feel like they're just driving the price up for their rival. Like, look, you got to pay a little bit more. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the Lions see value in this kid. Maybe. He but I think it, much. it definitely reveals that the Niners want someone who's not on their team right now to be the number two tight end. It's not Latu. It's not Willis. It could be this guy or someone in the draft. Yeah. Um, and there's some decent players in the draft, but... You know, I, I in now here's my thought on Law too, because we watched it standing next to each other all summer. He wasn't good. He wasn't bad. He was atrocious. He was really okay? bad. Um, but I get the feeling that the guy that we're gonna see this summer is gonna be like night and day different because I, I just kind of pegged him as a guy that there was too much going on in his head and he just couldn't concentrate. Once he understands the offense, comes back for year two. I, I, my guess is that Latu looks really pretty good in year two. That'd be my guess. 
see, the thing with him, like, he did drop a lot of passes. Maybe he'll clean that up. But he also looked like a guy who ran a 4-7-8. He really did. And he looked like a guy who had a, you know, a 7-3 in the cut. He didn't seem like he had a ton of speed or quickness. And then when he was dropping the ball, it's like, well, I don't really see what you bring to the table. He's 6'4", 240. He's not that big 6'5", 260 backup blocking tight end that they seem to be looking for. I, I've written him off completely. I've given Have him... Yeah, well, I mean, Danny Gray, Ben. He's in the Ty Davis price, Ben. Sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's understandable. It was a horrible summer that he had. Um, but... I, I think he's he's a, a much better mover than what he showed, and I think he's a much better catcher than what he showed. Um, and I think there's upside potential there. I mean, I'll say this. If they are forced to cut him, what a disaster pick. I mean, you're talking about wasting a third-round draft choice. They do that a lot. Yeah. No, they have. They've, they they've, do. They've it seems like they have this attitude years. like, you know, we're, this, we're, the, we're the best team in the NFC or the league. And we just have no time or patience to develop you. So either you can make an impact right away or we'll put you on the practice squad. And if that doesn't work, you're gone. Uh, ask Ty Davis Price or Trey Sermon. So, I mean, it's do or die for for Lockheed yeah. for sure this summer. Yeah. So Brock Wright, he might be here soon. Brandon Ayuk recently did an interview with Shannon Sharp and Chad Ochocinco. And really, for the first time this offseason, has really made it seem like he doesn't have a, a beef with the Niners. He was talking business. He's talking about his representatives, talking to the Niners, that they're having pro- professional conversations. Really made it seem like he's probably going to re-sign the way Debo did, Fred Warner did, George Kittle did. Was that the impression you got? What do you take of the uh, the Brandon Ayuk saga? Well, the biggest phrase was, and I was there today, you know, so I mean, it's like you're there at the facility working out. I yeah. think it pretty show pretty much shows your intention right is to get a deal done um and i think the niners want to get a deal done but you know it's it's they clearly have given themselves they i I would say this just from looking at all the uh indications from the outside world they have you know they're negotiating hard here i mean they're negotiating hard why because they got a quarterback they think they're gonna have to pay 40 to 50 million dollars and um, they've got a price tag on Ayuk. And if Ayuk comes in, you know, in and around their price tag, a little over, a little under, I think he's going to stick. If he gets to a certain number, I think they're going to bail. And the reason I think that is that they've ended, they've worked out J.C. Latham. They've worked out Fuguisi or uh, uh, T- uh, Fuaga, I should say, Taliisi Fuaga. They've worked out um, the LSU receiver, uh, who's going in the middle of the first round. So they've right. given themselves, they've taken a look at middle of the round receivers. And then they sent a huge contingent to Western Kentucky uh, yeah. for Malachi Corley. I would not be surprised if, um, you know, if, if, if they decided to trade Ayuk, get JC Latham and use 31 on Corley. Yeah, I could see that happening. I'm not sure that a team would necessarily trade that much for Brandon Ayuk right now, considering how good the draft class is for wide receivers. But if the Niners could get a top 20 pick for him, they might. It just seems like the momentum is going in the direction of them resigning him. And right. uh, I mean, John Lynch was very measured. You know what I mean? Hey, we could give him, we could, he could play out the fifth year option. We don't, it's all kind of things that could happen. You know, it's, they've been ruthless with contracts this offseason, just as Eric Armstead. But it sounds to me like Brandon Ayuk expects to be here at the end of the at the end of the day. And it also I want to it seems like he keeps saying he did everything the right way. I think he's more invested in this team than maybe even Debo. Like Debo is the one that said, I don't want to be here. Trade me. I don't want to be in this team. I don't want to be out here. Uh he came back. But Ayuk is a West Coast guy. Ayuk practices really hard. Ayuk should have been the the captain this year, not Debo. Like that's to me, they almost have to bring him back. He's a big part of their culture. You're there at practices. He's the one who sets the tone in May, in June. He does. He's he's just a better player, too. I mean, he's he he, he's he's got a better future. He's got a he's got more games in his future than Debo. 
Um, he's the better oh, route yeah. runner. I mean, he's the best. If right now, look at next, next year's weapons. Put them all on paper. Who would? Who's their best weapon on paper? I would say it's Ayuk because CMC is coming off of a really you know busy year where he touched the ball a lot. So I think it's Ayuk. So you can get rid of your best weapon. Doesn't no. seem like it makes sense. Also, how could you get rid of Brandon Ayuk when you re-signed Debo? Doesn't make any sense. Like Debo was had a good resume, he had an all-pro season, but he also had a down season. He only had one really good, one really great season. And he was a hybrid player. You're paying him for a lot of what he could do as a running back, and you gave him almost $24 million a year, but Brandon Ayuk didn't prove himself. That doesn't seem consistent at all. It seems like once you rewarded Debo, you got to bring back Brandon Ayuk. Well, and then look at what unless you he, have. Unless he only wants $30 million and above, which I don't see happening. Sorry. I mean, there's always a cutoff point, right? They got their right. budget. Prague's their negotiator. They're pretty tough. Uh, we just saw what they did to Eric Armstead. Yep. Um, they're, they're ruthless on some levels. But the receiver that means the most to your quarterback <sighs> is Ayuk mm -hmm. and you love your quarterback and the whole mm -hmm. off season's theme should be about bolstering the group around your quarterback. So build a fortress in front of him and make sure you resign his top receiver. If you start the, you know, the Brock Purdy era by letting go of his number one target, who he looks for on in, in, in cutting routes. I don't know. That seems like a, that seems like, you're not really doing best by Brock either. Right. Like if he has a down season and you trade Ayuk, how do you not blame yourself? Yeah. I mean, right? and Ayuk special. I mean, Ayuk, yeah. he, uh, he, Brock lives off the in route, in, in cutting route. Who's the receiver that you have that runs that route to near perfection? It's hmm. Ayuk. Who's the guy that he, I mean, think about all the moments of the season this year when Brock got into a pickle or whatever, fourth quarter against Cleveland, three in a row, wasn't it to Ayuk? So Seattle. Like, yeah, I mean for the win. Ayuk, yeah. Yeah. Ayuk's his guy. Yeah, absolutely. So it I think take, he knows it. It would take a good offer uh to get yeah. Ayuk. But I think they need to the Niners need to understand that. It's one thing to say, Eric, you're Eric Armstead, you're almost 31 years old. You have plantar fasciitis. It's not going away. We don't really want you anymore. That's fair. But what are you going to say to Brandon Ayuk? Boy, you're 25, getting kind of 26, getting kind of old. Uh, yeah. You haven't missed a game in a long time. Hmm. You're really tough over the middle, and you go deep, and you block. Ooh, geez, you're just biggest play you're in the, the doghouse three years ago. Like, what are you going to say? Biggest play of the Super Bowl, you beat Sneed like a drum, and your quarterback didn't have any time to find you. You know what I mean? I, he he's pretty much impeccable. There's, there's nothing you can say about him on the field, off the field, on games, in practice. He should be a captain and a, and a foundational player for this team. He really should be. He should and be. trading him probably would be a, a, as bad of an idea as trading Buckner. He's that kind of a foundational piece. He's bigger than just what he does. In his on in the box score, he sets the tone for the whole organization. To me, you can't. The one thing though that we haven't touched on is, okay, all this is true, and mm. you can't really have sixty million dollars of wide that receiver. wide receiver. Yeah. So, well, somebody's well, who's the one really go. making too much money? Yeah, it's Debo. It's Debo. So that's the conversation you have to have. And I know you can't trade them now and create cap space, but there are things you can do after June first or next year. So maybe they'll have this very expensive wide receiver room for one year because Brock hasn't gotten extended yet. And they'll chalk it up to, well, we're not paying a quarterback. So we can we can spend $60 million on a wide receiver room for one year, but not for two. This might be an anomaly for one year. And you know, Debo might, this might be Debo's last year on the team. Well, and then don't discount that if they everything goes their way, mm -hmm. they get all the players they want to get. Maybe they get a Malachi Corley. They could do the unthinkable, which is the best cap move, which would be to deal Debo this year after June first. Mm -hmm. You know, you could. They could do that. Um, there is some savings that could happen. It just doesn't make sense for competitive reasons, unless you feel like you've got a hell of a receiver room. So we'll see what they do receiver wise in the draft or in free agency the rest of the way. There's still some players out there. They're, they're and they're they've worked out a number of receivers. 
who knows? Maybe the draft breaks right and they get a receiver they love. Maybe they get a couple of receivers they love and they do the unthinkable and they trade Debo after June 1st uh, because they'll get more after June 1st than they will next year. Yeah, one way or another, this could be the end of the road for Debo Samuel with the Niners. Either this year or next year, uh, they could trade him. And probably they should because, I mean, look at the hard stance they took with Eric Armstead, who we're going to talk about next. Yeah. Like, sorry, dude. I mean, you're getting old. You're making way too much money. We can't justify paying you $28 million in the cap. What about Debo? He's not 30 yet, but he does miss time. I mean, fair is fair. They might have to do that with him eventually, too. Well, we talked about it. I mean, brought, you're going to pay your quarterback, you know, fifty million instead of a million. Yeah. Well, there's going to be forty nine million dollars worth of players right. leaving because this is a cap sport and it's a hard cap. It's not one of these soft caps you can maneuver around. So, who's that fifty million? We know it's Eric Armstead. It's probably Juice. Might be Debo. I mean, it's got to be. I mean. You can go go to spottrack.com, look up 49ers, look at all the top guys they have at the top of the payroll. Four or five of those guys are going to be gone. You know, whether it's this year preparing for Brock's deal or if it's next year, you know, reacting to Brock's deal, there's going to be some guys, there's going to be a bloodletting of guys who make big money on this roster. Irfan Merza says, uh, did you guys see the IUK interview last night? Yeah, we're talking about that. I um, what, what, what was your takeaway from what he said? Well, I mean, I, I just feel like he doesn't want, he's choosing his words carefully. You only yeah. do that if you're, if you want to stay, I think ultimately he wants to stay. Um, but Prague's yeah. a really tough negotiator. And if he doesn't get somewhere na- in the neighborhood of his price, as he said, he's going to, what do you use his fingers? He's going to be walking. Yeah, that's fair. And it's fair for him to take a hard stance now. It just seems like if when you compare it to what happened between the Niners and Debo Samuel, it seems much um, better. I is here. He's not hanging out in Miami, uh, trying like daring the Niners to get rid of him. He's here in the building, saying it only makes sense for you to reward someone like me. I've done everything right, and he's right. And I expect that they will. He's like the Fred Warner of the offense. And there's the more you dig deep, the more you realize, man. Shanahan and Lynch love that player. You know what I mean? Shanahan and, you know, Lynch so knew. yeah, I mean, but I mean, they loved him in the draft. You saw yeah. Shanahan, you know, at his home with his children, cheering, chump, jumping up and down, clapping. Then you research. I think Lynch is real is some has some relationship with his agent. Uh, obviously he's got a relationship with Herm Edwards, who was his college coach. I mean, they love, they handpicked and loved Iuke and, um, and he's fulfilled that 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 uh, vision and so the last thing they want to do is let him go the, but but there's Prague and they'll play this good cop bad cop thing and they they do want to they're not going to just pay him an absurd sum so um we'll see we'll see how it goes i i think they'll get it done i do yeah i think they'll get it done i mean if they were going to if they gave debo samuel 24 million dollars a year 2 years ago they seem like they should be open to paying brandon ayuk 26 27 28 i mean he's worth it and he's better than debo samuel they clearly don't want to take weapons away from brock purdy and they can work it out down the line uh when it comes as a vis-a-vis debo not necessarily brandon Ayuk. eric armstead has a grievance with the 49ers he's with the jaguars he got all the money he wanted and he had a happy ending but he um which is pause anyway he uh wasn't that kind of happy ending yeah, what? Anyway, um, he has a podcast as well, and I guess he wanted to set the record straight about what the Niners offered him and why he requested his release. I'll be honest. It was less than I expected. I wasn't expecting the Niners would offer him $6 million, and so I could see why he was shocked. He said he was extremely, he felt extremely disrespected, and he got a lot more in the open market, to his credit. What do you think of it all? I am it may it uh it's a it's a number that screams get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I know I can't like I quit. can't say it any resign I can't say yeah. it diplomatically. When you're making three times that you get offered a third of what you're making, that's like, dude, 
we really don't want you back here yeah. and we really want you to go elsewhere. And I understand, and I'm sure it was shocking and it probably was hurtful uh, for him because he is identified so much with the Niners. He's so much uh, one of the leaders in the room. He's one of the faces of the franchise in the, in the, in the community. He's done so much reading to children, all of his initiatives, um, what he's done up in Sacramento. It's a, it's amazing. But the bottom line is, and you kind of already referenced it, he didn't just have an injury. Yeah. He had a chronic injury. Right. And he probably had two. He, yeah. he, you know, the, the, the plantar fasciitis, undoubtedly chronic. But the knee injury might be chronic, too. And yeah. I think the Niners wanted to offer him a number that was so low that he would not take it. Because if he took it, it would probably blow up their cap. And when you heard, you were there when Shanahan spoke earlier this week in Orlando, when he was asked about Malik Collins, he wasn't even like five words in before he said, and he's healthy. Yeah. You know, so that was a big part of it. They wanted younger, healthier um, players at that position. And in Elliott and in Malik Collins, they got younger, healthier players. Yeah, I mean, they offered him, they offered Armstead less than the Jets offered Javon Kinlaw, which again, I can see why Armstead would take that as a slap in the face. But frankly, I think the, the Niners did the right thing. His plantar fasciitis. I don't understand what the Jaguars were thinking. No, I do. Their general manager is Trent Balky. I mean, we know Trent Balky. He, he well, all he does is make big gambles on players with big injuries. It's what he does. So good for Eric Armstead. He was drafted by Trent Balky. He got paid by Trent Balky again. I really think that's not going to work out well for Jacksonville, but I'm not rooting for him to get injured. I just, it just seems like such a mistake. And I think the Niners made the right call because if he goes down again this year and misses most of the season, then you regret paying him anything. And you're in a lurch because you don't have any players behind him, really. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the, the one thing, though, that if you're Eric, you go, what? is, you know, he played more games this year than Yatur Gross Matos, and Gross Matos got more money, you know, or, you know, they offered... That's a good point. Gross Matos how do you account for that? Money. Yeah. So how do, how do you sit there and go, well, we just didn't want to pay the guy because he was hurt, and then say, hey, Yatur Gross Matos, come on down. But I think it was just that they had decided they wanted to go with Elliott and Collins. They probably had negotiated those deals out. Uh, they probably said you know what, now we're in a lurch because now what if Eric takes less to come back? We don't even have a less slot for him to come back. Oh, okay, we'll offer him like five or $6 million and we won't know he won't come back. Oh my God, that's going to insult him. So I understand. I mean, it's big business, man, and it's ruthless and it's um, just the way it is. I feel bad for Eric because he was a... He's a really good football player, but he's a really good football player who's on the wrong side of 30 with two chronic injuries on a team that is hell bent to win this year. And they need him. You know, it, what, he was going to be unhappy if he came in back to this room for less than he made. So they knew he had to move on. So then it was just a matter of, okay, replace him. Then they replaced him. They're like, oh, crap. Uh, we replaced this guy. Now we have to offer him something that we know he won't take because if we offer him 10, he might take it. And then we have to pay him and then we don't have room for that. So we got to offer him like five. We'll offer him six. It's a third of what he made. He'll be insulted. He'll go. And that's what happened. But it, it's, it's not, it's not just that uh, to me, you mentioned like he, your tour gross Matos missed time too. Yeah. Okay. But he doesn't have plantar fasciitis. That's the problem. It's not just that he missed games. It's that he hasn't been healthy in two years, and he's not really going to be healthy ever again. This is going to be right. something he has to manage forever. So what is he really worth? When he made his pitch on his podcast, he listed all the things that he does well. He watches film, and he works out, and he's dedicated. Like, yeah, and you have plantar fasciitis. That, that, I'm sorry. It's like if he were a house on the market, he would be a house with a crack foundation. So what is that worth? Oh, well, it's a mansion. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it has a crack foundation. I'm good. Or, you know, it has, you know, $28,000 of mold and water damage. Uh -huh. And it's like, yeah. dude, 
you will be paying that abatement. You will yep. be getting rid of that water damage. That is going to cost you. So, yeah, I mean, I thought they made the right move. Plus, I actually, can, to me, I mean, we haven't talked a ton, but um, I like both those tackles they got. I, I like the power of Collins, and yet he's got pass rush ability. And I love the run stuffing numbers this last year from Jordan Elliott. He's 310 pounds. He's got quick feet. I think the, the, the right, they made the right personnel move there. Yeah, I agree. And it was a business move. It was the right business personnel move. And the, I guess the reason I keep coming back to what Armstead said is he made it seem like it was personal. He felt extremely disrespected. Like the Niners slapped him in the face and had some personal thing against him. I don't agree. Also, he, he made it kind of seem like he didn't appreciate they didn't appreciate what he does as a football player. I don't agree. They chose him over DeForest Buckner. So they they demonstrated for a long time that they appreciate what he does, uh, despite not being a big sack guy. I mean, they get it. They gave him like $85 million. This is about plantar fasciitis. It's a big deal. Can't get around it. Hasn't been healthy in two years. I mean, NFL teams in a capped sport need to sprint away from all chronic injuries. Yes. Thank you. That's it. D4 had a chronic back injury. How'd that go? Anything that you know is going to, you know, you don't want to sign injured play. I mean, think about this. When these guys do extensions for players they love, Nick Bosa, whatever, when do they announce them? Like 10 minutes before the guy's going to run on the field. Why? Yeah. Because they want to make sure if they're going to throw out that kind of money, they're getting a healthy football player. So they do yeah. the the uh, they do the the physical in the morning. They sign the papers, and the guy goes out on the field. They could do it two weeks early, but why? That's two weeks of risk that you're taking. That your player that you just signed is going to get hurt. You want to make sure that you're getting healthy players, especially in the capped era. And he's got plantar fasciitis, so it's like they knew there's you know there's 17 games, and he's not going to play 17. No. He's not going to play 17 games for the Giants. Here's what's most likely going to happen with Eric Armstead this year. He'll miss five to 10 games and kind of pace himself throughout the regular season. And if the Jaguars make the re the playoffs, he'll try to be at his best in mid, in mid January. He often does show up for playoff games, but for the regular season, what you get in a week to week basis, you could get absolutely nothing. Sometimes he's on the field and you don't know it. In There's October, gonna be there's going to be a story in October of how smart is Trent Balky and how dumb are the 49ers to let go of a player as talented as Eric Armstead. And it will be right. And then he'll miss six or seven games down the stretch. And, and the Niners will be like, the Niners will be right. See, see what I'm talking about? Okay, let's pause and make some picks, some sleeper picks. The Warriors play in 29 minutes, so let's get these in. I got, I need some action. Otherwise, I can't watch regular season basketball. It's too boring, Larry. It's too boring. I hear you. You see what I'm saying? Steph Curry, 26 and a half points. We could do that. We could do turnovers. They give you options on the sleeper app. What do you like? Um, I, I mean, this Steph, Steph Curry. Steph Curry playing in Charlotte is a return home. So I think Steph Curry goes off in this game. Okay. Um, I like it. Let's start know, off with the more on Steph. That's a good place to start. We're making he's picks. from Charlotte. There'll be people in the stands that he's trying to impress. And this is not just another game. And so I think he'll go off. Draymond Green coming back from getting ejected. Got to gotta put a pick down on Draymond. Can we get a, an ejection pick? <laughs> he will not be ejected. No. No, I guess it, okay. How about what do you like for him? Double double? No, I don't like that. Mm. Seven and a half rebounds. Yeesh. Six and a half assists. Yeah, I'll, I'll go over six and a half assists. Okay, I like that too. Uh Clay. I've been I've been winning with Clay on threes, but they moved him up to four and a half. He'd been at three and a half for about a week or two. Four and a half's a lot. Yeah, and maybe he passes a few up for for Steph tonight. Uh, I go under there. If I yeah, have under. Four and a half. I'm with you on that one. And let's do one for the other team. Can't even name the it. terrible team we got here. 
Yeah, it's a bad team. Wow. Um, that's a really bad team. I can tell you their leading scorer is LaMelo Ball. And, um, yeah, I don't even know who's who's going to be in there. I want to try something. Instead of doing that, can we do – I want to do some baseball picks. I don't know why. Can you do multiple sports at the same time? That would be fun. Sleeper. Well, we just a lot of times, a lot of times these these late in the season NBA games are pretty easy. If you just look at their last game, let's look at their last game. How about Durant? Just randomly Durant, his last game. Yeah, what are you put thirty, for? and they got about twenty four and a half. I think that's easy money. Uh, who are they playing? Good question. OKC. Hmm. Uh, what's his original home? Yeah, I like that. I like that. He'll be awake. He'll, He'll be, be awake. awake. Wake is good. Awake. All right, those well, are my picks. You know, I mean, seriously, you always got to go for games where guys are going to show because guys don't show up for every single game, but they do show up usually when they're going back to where they used to play. All right, I think we got that one right. I think we're going to make some serious ducats on that one. Uh, if you guys want to play, Promo code cone, C-O-H-N. Get that deposit match up to $500. Also, there's a QR code on the screen. There it is. There it is. All right. Let's do some mock draft. I'm ready to do a mock draft. Okay. I'm an NFL draft expert, as everyone knows. I watch college football every week, and I have strong takes. No. Look, what I like about the NFL draft is first-round picks, everyone can kind of get in on this. There's only so many players who are projected. There's Stuff is on YouTube. You can get detailed draft profiles and make an informed opinion, and I've done that. I know exactly who the Niners are going to draft in round one and round two. I haven't talked to anyone about it, but it came to me, and I'm very certain that I'm correct. Larry also knows we may have different names, but that's you know that's how it goes. So who you got? Round one. I know who they're going to take. Who do you think it's going to be? Um... Wrong. Are we betting or are we, is this just, we're just, are we betting? betting? Yeah, we can bet. Betting's fun. We, or are we, we, are we wagering? Sure. I mean, I think Tyler Guyton is probably the safest pick, but I like in, that. In the off, he, offensive tackle from Oklahoma. I like that. But yeah. That'd be a good pick. You know, you know, and I know that the Niners don't take offensive tackles. I don't they think take, they're going to take an offensive tackle. They take on that one. I just don't. Play. Yeah, I'm gonna maybe. say I'm gonna say Braden Fisk from okay. Florida State. Talk to us. Tell tell us who Braden Fisk well, is. Of course, I know who he is. Yeah, but he's a, don't. He's a gigantic. He, he started at Western Michigan. He transferred to Florida State. Um, mm. He at at the combine he had incredible footwork on the drills. He's six five two ninety two. He Chris Chris Kacerik will love him because the motor burns constantly. The guy plays incredibly hard. He's a pass rushing guy. So like you have Har Hargrave and you have, you know, these two tackles they just brought in, but you're going to need a little bit of more interior rush and Braden Fisk will give that to you. He'll definitely be on the board. I think he's slated to go in the middle of round two. I could see them moving back a spot or two and maybe taking him at 33, 34, but Braden Fisk, Florida State, defensive tackle. That's who I'm going with. And this is your prediction for who, what the Niners are going to do. Prediction. Prediction. I like that's it. That's not necessarily like what it. I would do, but that's that's what I think they'll do. And it makes total sense. They go defense. I'm going to go. My, my player is going to be on defense as well. Uh, they love defensive linemen. And just because they got two defensive tackles in free agency doesn't mean they won't take one in round one. Good pick. I'm going... Cooper DeGene from Iowa. He uh, was He's not, the a, not a D, not a D lineman though. Not a D lineman. They've been they've been looking for DBs throughout free agency, but they haven't really pulled the trigger on one. Of all their DBs, the only one, the only starter who signed past this upcoming season is Jair Brown, Hafunga, Diamador Lenore, Traverius Ward, Ambry Thomas. All free agents after this year. I think it's pretty clear. They're looking for a DB. And what is interesting, what's cool about Cooper DeGene is that he could play safety. He could play nickel. He could play corner. He's a gunner. 
He's a punt returner. He was the returner of the year in the Big Ten. He was the DB of the year in the Big Ten. He broke his fibula at the end of the year. I don't think he's tested yet, but I, he had a bunch of interceptions in college. He's probably going to test pretty well once he does. He's supposed to get picked right around at the end of round one. I think he'd be a good fit as a guy who could actually play right away uh, wherever in the defensive backfield, be their punt returner and their gunner, as opposed to an offensive lineman who wouldn't play right away for the 49ers. You know, according to um, they're they're saying this kid ran really really fast. Now I don't he's know. Supposed if he's, to be a good athlete. I don't know if he if they have his workout yet, but he's a hell of a football player. And if you watch yeah. I, Iowa football, um, really a player. They, their offense is unwatchable, but their yeah. de- their defense is just spectacular. And this guy's a really good football player. I mean, yeah. really. good. So yeah, good, I'll a good be a athlete. Uh, it's got ball skills. Um, yeah, I think he'd be a really good fit. The special teams is nice. People say he may not be able to play much man-to-man coverage. Niners don't really want to play much man-to-man coverage. He's a hell of a tackler. I don't know. Tim, like no, no, the kind of he's corner a, they he's like. He's a great athlete. He's a great athlete. This guy, you know, they're saying he's going to run around four five zero, but his, during high school, he ran the hundred meters in eleven point one six. And the 200 meters in 22-1-2. So, I mean, that's despite being 6'1 and weighing 207 pounds. So, this guy is really, really fast. Really, really athletic. Really, really good football player. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, they think he's going to run like 4-4. Uh, so, that's that's pretty damn good time. I ran 11-3 in high school. It's a true story. 11-3, really? I ran, I ran 11-3. I could move. I couldn't crack 10, you know, 10, but 11, three. You I was 165 be- pounds. I, I didn't really have, I wasn't really carrying much. Where'd you play? How, O'Dowd? I was at O'Dowd and I ran track my senior year. I ran uh, hurdles, 300 hurdles. We had some fast guys in the team. We had, a, we had one guy who ran a 10, seven, one guy who ran 11 flat. Fast dudes at, o, at Bishop O'Dowd. Good, good school. school, man. My nephew good just school. got in. Shout out to Sam Strauss. Scott I, play, I remember playing them in basketball, football, and uh, lacrosse. They they were good in all three yeah. sports. We've already we've always taken those sports cr- seriously. Okay, round two. Brian Shaw, played, we, Brian Shaw, Tony Jackson. Those are two. Brian great. Shaw, and then we Tony had Napoleon Hoffman as a coach recently. Tony Jackson oh, yeah. though was a great player who that was pre Brian Shaw, and he played for uh, DePaul. He was one of the best players in the country. I believe who's now that linebacker Oakland. for the Raiders who went to O'Dowd? Uh, yeah. Um, I saw him at the Super Bowl. Why am I blanking on his name? Yeah, I'm blanking on his name too. He's a great guy too. I yeah, forget I just I, met him at the Super Bowl. I forget his name. Anyway, yeah, it'll come to me. Yeah. Okay. It the Niners' <laughs> second round pick <laughs> didn't come right. either. Uh, we went defense in round one. Are they going to finally go offense in round two? The end of round this pick sixty three, I believe. Yeah, so now in round two, I think, and a lot of people would be like, oh, well, if they go D-line in round one, they have to go offensive tackle in round two. I don't think they're going to. Oh. I I don't think they're going to. I I think that there are really good offensive tackles in the third round, and I think they're going to go in the third round. And I'll, I'll give you the names. Javon Foster from Missouri, Christian Jones from Texas, um, Green, Garrett Greenfield, South Dakota State. I think in Caden Wallace, also they looked at from Penn State. I think one of those guys is going to be their pick in the third or fourth round. Um, I, I, I think in round two, this is where you're they're going to go, um, surprise us. And I'm, I'll say right now, I think it's going to be Malachi Corley. Hmm. Interesting. Kentucky. You know, He's if they want to trade, the, what's their ahead. pick? 63. Yeah, th- this guy's listed at 74. So mm-hmm. I think he'll be there. He's 5'11", he on CBS? 220. Um, no, I'm looking at Draft Tech as far as okay, okay, uh, okay, okay. where they're ranked. Okay. But yeah, Malachi Corley, I think, is going to be their second-round pick. I'll tell you the other guy that I love, and I know it doesn't make any sense, and I know it's like people would be like, what? They're not doing that. But I think Blake Corum from Michigan, the, mm. the running back, is spectacular. And um, 
I think it's going to be an offensive weapon. I think it's going to be Malachi Corley or, or Blake Corum. And then I think they'll go offensive line. I mean, they could also, the only other spot I think it potentially could be is it could be a corner, you know, if like a TJ Tampa uh, was there, maybe a Max Melton, if he was there, maybe those are the two guys that I think could be in round two corner wise. But um, I don't think, I think they'll be gone by the time the Niners pick. And I think they'll be choosing an offensive player. And I'll say Malachi Corley. Okay. I think they're going to take an offensive tackle here. They took Aaron Banks in round two. He was redshirted, and then he started uh, his second year. They recently signed Brandon Parker, who was like the 65th pick in the draft. I don't know that Brandon Parker is going to actually make the team. Like He isn't that good, but I think that's sort of the level of athlete they're trying to find at the right tackle spot. Like Someone who would be a late second, th- early third round pick. I think they're looking at Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. That's yeah. Interesting. They've been they've had success drafting offensive linemen from Notre Dame. Aaron Banks, Mike McGlinchey, like I know we we sort of Mike McGlinchey's a bit of a punchline with the Niners, but they always liked him. And he'd still be on this team if he wasn't making 17 million dollars a year. Uh so I think they trust that program um and I think you could get a starting right tackle who would sit for a year, develop, and then be the guy in a year or two in uh, Blake Fisher. And you wouldn't have pressure to play him right away if you draft him in round two. Yeah, that's a good name. That's a good one. I like that. Um, I, I, I'll say Javon Foster of the, you know, if they go O line there. But man, I mean, I think you couldn't go wrong really in either, with either guy. I think you've got, you know, big, uh, athletic, long arm guys who can be developed. My my feeling is that they want to stock the cupboard, but they don't want to start those guys. So they're not going to they're yeah. going to take a defensive Agreed. lineman or a wide receiver corner early, and then they're going to take like maybe two guys that they really like developmentally on the O line. Yeah, and they're going to plug them in when they're ready. And if they were if they were to take an offensive tackle in round one. I don't think they would take that guy unless they thought he could eventually move to left tackle. They took McGlinchey in round one. I think they thought he was going to eventually move to left tackle and replace Joe Staley, and they were wrong. He played a little left tackle at Notre Dame. Some people thought he could make the transition. Some people didn't. He couldn't. He can't. He's a right tackle. But in round two, they took a left guard. They could absolutely take a right tackle if they liked the guy. And again, I know that they trust uh, the Notre Dame products to use a kind of a dehumanizing term for football players products do you ever notice how many dehumanizing terms are for football players weapons toys products it's like <laughs> right all the time they're, they're machines they're yeah all that people. swiss they're army not, knife they're not humans they're a new yeah. ball of clay for the coach to mold it's like no nah, it's a person they have parents <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay but one I mean, more thing they, they, you know i'll say Go this ahead. too i watched the national championship um, Michigan, and they got this kid, Ladarius Henderson, who was an Arizona State kid who transferred, and they kept pulling their right guard and right tackle, and I believe he played right tackle for Michigan. And this dude, 6'4", 3'10", with speed, and he's going to be on the board there too. So uh, Michigan, Ohio, you know, um, Notre Dame, you know, there's some there's some really good offensive tackles uh, that are going to be on the board in the second and third round. Just saying, it's supposed to be a deep a deep class of offensive tackles. They'd be wise to get one. Fish and chips says, "Who cares about spoiled human Armstead? Not me." I just thought it was tone deaf that he would go on his podcast and talk about what he got offered. Like, first of all, only six million dollars. I'll take it. And what is the fan base that you think is going to rally around you? Niner fans? You just requested your release. Jaguar fans don't care what happened to you in San Francisco. So I, I didn't under, really understand what that was about. Keep it to yourself. I'll tell you, the, the sad part is how many people are just like good freaking riddance. I mean, it's like, wow, dude. I mean, I understand. I understand. It's like there's our team and the other team. And now he's not going to be on our team anymore. Right. But the 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 slamming of the door uh, in some of these comments on Eric Armstead, 
it was, it was, I mean, Niner fans are all about the Niners. As soon as you're not a Niner, you might as well be dead. Now, Jed promised Armstead, hey, look, you know, when the time's right, you'll be welcome back in the family. You're a Niner. You'll always be a Niner. And I fully guarantee that you're going to see Eric Armstead, you know, doing something in and around the Niners post-career. But Niner fans, man, as soon as you're on the other team, it's like, get the hell out of here. Well, he he requested his release. It'd be one thing if he got, if they just cut him and he would be, he would have been willing to work with them, but he wasn't. And he wanted to get more money in Jacksonville, which is totally fine. But I don't think you're going to, you can at that point expect Niner fans to be like, look, he made He made the right decision. Like he knows he made the right decision, but he sort of, everybody makes the right decision for themselves here. Right. The Niners made the right decision for themselves. I think Jacksonville made the right decision for themselves. They they need to get, you know, Trent Balky's need to, needs to get a team that's ready to play, and you got a player in Armstead who's doesn't need to be coached up. And then Armstead did what was right for him. So, you know what? It's business in the NFL. We shouldn't judge it. We shouldn't try to put more into it than it is. Everybody got what they wanted out of it. Fish and Ships says nobody bid on BA in the draft twenty three this year. Nobody bid on him last year. Were they trying to trade him last year? Um, possibly. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we'll see. I, you know, the thing about BA that's interesting is there's a few teams, Jacksonville, the Raiders, uh, the Patriots, the Steelers, where they're looking for a wide receiver and they don't want to wait around because they may get fired. Like Trent Baalke, you know, may need a wide receiver. And if he doesn't get one, he gets fired. Mm-hmm. And Mike Tomlin has been awesome, but he hasn't won a playoff game in five years. It's time for him to win. They need a rook. They need a receiver. He may, probably doesn't want to go with the rookie. So I understand why these teams want the veteran wide receiver over the rookie. Um, but we'll see when push comes to shove what they actually offer. Quinn Howard says, who do we draft third? We've had luck in later rounds. I don't know. That's all on Kyle Shanahan. What do you guys think he's going to do? Running back? Lake Corum. I think in third round, they're going to offensive tackle. Okay. I, I, I would say that's where it's Javon Foster, Garrett Greenfield. I think that's a perfect tackle spot right there uh, for them. Dumpster Fire Dan asks, Larry, why Fisk over Darius Robinson? It's a great question. I would say because they're more a little bit more fortified um, at defensive end. And if you look like who's their interior backups um you have what you've got givens um you know i i I think they're i think they need more of an interior pass rusher okay i got i got a bonus topic i've seen some rumors on twitter that the chargers might trade justin herbert and i know it's just rumors and it doesn't really make sense financially until after justin june 1st but I was at the owners' meetings, the NFL annual meeting, and I sat and listened to Harbaugh talk for half an hour just for the novelty of it. I used to cover him. It's been so long. He's back. It's like Twilight Zone in the 60s. It's so strange. He's like an older man, and he's like mellowed out, and he likes talking to the press. It's so strange. So I uh, asked him about Justin Herbert. What do you like about Justin Herbert? Why are you eager to coach him? And I thought he gave a decidedly lukewarm answer for someone that a lot of people think is flat out elite. And he said, you know what? I watched all of his film and there's no question he can make all the throws. And then he was pretty much done praising him. And he was like, you know, but at this point, it's really about winning and competing and wanting to compete in the NFC, in the AFC West and wanting to compete against Patrick Mahomes. And he, he wasn't like saying he didn't want to, but he was sort of like, that's what he was focusing on. And to me, what he's saying is, yeah, I mean, it's physically, there's no question about Justin Herbert. There's never been a question about Justin Herbert, but how come he doesn't win? He didn't really win that much in college. He doesn't really win in the NFL. He makes a ton of money. What kind of a competitor is he really? Um, and then he was asked about J.J. McCarthy. And I, the way he talked about it, and I know he's usually is over the moon with the quarterbacks he's coached. He had a lot of praise for Kaepernick and Alex Smith too, but he really talked about J.J. McCarthy. Like he's the best quarterback of all time. Best pro day of all time. Ultimate competitor. This the ultimate makeup for a, a quarterback. And it kind of made me thinking, like, 
Are they going to draft JJ McCarthy? Are they going to have both guys on the team? Are they going to are they going to potentially trade Justin Herbert? Because Kyle, I mean, I, Jim seems a hundred percent sold on JJ McCarthy. I don't know. What do you think? It's super interesting because you know when he talked about Alex Smith, what did he say? He's tougher than a two dollar steak. Right. Right. And what does Jim want in a quarterback? He wants himself. He wants, yeah. and he and he thinks of himself as kind of an overlooked tough guy, right? And that's what JJ McCarthy is. He's it's not Herbert, and it's, it's not, not Herbert. Herbert. It's not uh-uh. Herbert with his bandanas and his uh-uh. and his awesome throwing motion and his l- losses. So I mean, you could get so much for Herbert, mm-hmm. so much for Herbert. I so much. Now they can't trade him until after June first financially, but they can yeah. trade him after June first. Maybe you draft uh, McCarthy at six and because he'll be there most likely. And then uh, you trade Herbert in June, you know, for a, maybe for not a, for a King's ransom. I mean, yeah, for a King's it. ransom. What, what do you think Herbert fetches? I would say Herbert fetches two ones and two twos at least. And you, you get a huge contract off the books. And you get a, a quarterback on a rookie deal, could blow up in your face. But it seems like the kind of thing that Jim Harbaugh would entertain doing. I look, I was just sitting there and I asked, I was expecting him to say a lot of praise for Justin Herbert. Cause what I was expecting is he took this job because of Justin Herbert. That's why he's here. But that didn't sound like that way at all to me. It's like, oh, yeah, I mean, we all can see how he throws, but he still has lots of proof. He took this. Meanwhile, job JJ McCarthy of- is freaking proven. Like, what? Well, and I think he took the job because of Brendan Staley. Okay. He just looks at Staley as just terrible. And he's like, ah, you know what? I can be way better than that guy. Yeah. So, and they're loaded. They're loaded roster wise. And, you know, he's got his hand picked GM, which he didn't have the first time around. He That's wanted true. Mike, Mike, uh, um, well, who Lombardi. Do you want? Michael Lombardi. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And instead he got Trent Balky. Now he gets this Hortiz kid, guy and he likes him. He wants him. So Jim's all about control. I could see them going JJ McCarthy and uh trading trading Herbert. I mean, you'd get so much for Herbert, it would be unbelievable. Also, it would be like a hostile takeover of the team. Like you thought this was your team? You thought this is Justin Herbert's team, him making fifty five million dollars? No. He's gone. My team, new quarterbacks, twenty three years old. What do you think? <laughs> I'm just trying to think what team would then trade for Herbert. I mean, it'd probably be any number of teams interested. I mean, what maybe team my would maybe for Miami. Herbert? Maybe Miami, if um, you know, if their quarterback continues to fall on his face. What about Minnesota? Minnesota. I got maybe Justin Jefferson. That might work. Maybe Dallas. Would Dallas maybe. make go for a big maybe New England? I mean, they, look, they got rid of their wide receivers. They're trying to run the ball a lot. Why are you spending fifty five million dollars on a quarterback? So you can run the ball more than any other team. And also, Herbert doesn't seem like a hardball guy. At all. At all. No. I'm sorry. It, like, Harbaugh is intense, and Justin Herbert seems like a shrinking violet. Doesn't he? Herbert just seems like super gifted and a little fragile. Uh-huh. And, and Harbaugh seems like he wants, you know, a reincarnation of him. I mean... Justin Herbert, what kind of leader is he? Does he have a voice? Does he talk? He throws a beautiful ball. He throws a beautiful ball. We all know and that. He's rough, but... And he's roughly 500. Uh-huh. Why? It's never his fault, right? Right. I don't know. I didn't expect Harbaugh to say that. Again, I thought he took the job for Herbert. But mm, we'll see. It's coming to monitor. Maybe he views Herbert as a coach killer. Maybe he, used, he views Herbert as a trade chip. Right. You don't know, but it's it's highly intriguing. It's oh, it highly is. intriguing because I was over here. I mean, I don't watch Herbert every week. I see him here and there. He looks great. He makes some phenomenal throws, but then he doesn't make the playoffs, and it's not his fault, right? It's Brandon Staley's fault. It's everyone's fault. Uh huh. But if Jim Harbaugh thinks he's gonna hold him back, then God, that's not good for Justin. That's not- well, and, and and if year one is, I mean, if you think about it this way too. Year one's about. You know, having your initial draft and getting out of cap hell. Okay. Um, maybe year two is about 
you know, um, setting yourself up for some draft bonanza by trading the quarterback. We've never seen Harbaugh really have to coach a highly paid elite quote unquote quarterback. He had Alex Smith. Alex Smith had no leverage. Then he had Colin Kaepernick on a rookie deal. Then he left. Now he's got Justin Herbert making all this money and he might be a little sensitive. And do you really see Jim Harbaugh like tiptoeing around Justin Herbert's ego and feelings or just bringing in someone he knows he can coach? And and the way he talked about J.J. McCarthy, oh my God, you would have thought that J.J. McCarthy was like his dream human being. Mm-hmm. He not loves just quarterback. J.J. McCarthy. It was over the top. He kept and, talking and about J.J. Him. is supposedly tough, and he's a leader, and this and that. I could see Harbaugh saying, "Hey, give me J.J. McCarthy, and I'll move off of, I'll move off of." Uh, you know, the guy who looks like a, a, almost the kind of like central casting quarterback, because that's what he's got right now. He's got the long armed sunshine, you know, kind of Trevor Lawrence 2.0, um, the kind of quarterback that everybody dreams of having. Um, I, I would not su- be surprised if they pivoted off of him. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Something to watch. All right, it's four o'clock on the West Coast on Friday. We missed our show on our regular Tuesday afternoon slot because I was in Orlando, um, which was all right. I mean, not to just totally dump on another city, but like not a ton of culture, although there's a lot of Brazilians there. I didn't know that. That's some culture. You didn't go to Disney World? No, I'm not a big Disney guy. I feel like it's almost like deviant behavior. Like if you go to Disney World, you need need to have like eight kids. (laughs) Like what are you doing on your own? Yeah, right. at least at least one. How about that? Yeah, you gotta at least well, you gotta be a guardian. You can't just be going to Disney like, what are you doing here, sir? Oh, right. I'm here for the the rides. No, you're not. So yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, you know, and also there's a lot of tourists there. What tourists, was the, what was the weather like? It was uh pretty windy at first, and then it warmed up a little bit. It was better than this. This is depressing. But it wasn't Stop raining. It wasn't hot. It wasn't hot. It wasn't that hot, but it was better than this. It's so, oh, and yeah. also, oh, also another thing about Florida, I don't go to Florida that much and it's cool. I'm not dumping off Florida. You get an Uber and they're like, so where are you from? Oh, I'm from San Francisco. And immediately they're like, oh, it's such a shame what's happening in California these days. It's like, hey, shut up. You live in Orlando. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. It's such a shame what's going on. So we, I, I just get into town and the guy's like, okay, so you're staying in downtown. As long as you don't go on this side of the freeway, you'll be fine. And he goes, but actually, you're from California, so you might be you might have a good time over on that side of the freeway. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? What Jeez. does that mean? Wow. I was offended. Guys taking shots. Yeah, who are you to take shots at me, Central Florida man? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I enjoy Northern California. You enjoy Central Florida. Yeah. Seriously, I- that's where you come back and be like, hey, here's, you know, you give them a gigantic paper bag. What's that for? So you can catch one of those gigantic bugs that you guys have like, and we don't have here. You know, as, 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 there you go. As, like, there was like a, an older Brazilian lady. As, as I told her I was from Cal- San Francisco. She was like, Oh man, it's, it's terrible. What's going on out there. It's like you do God. They've indoctrinated everyone out here. You should come. I'll th- we have a great time. It's DeSantis. It's the DeSantis commercials. He uses it was crazy. As that really kid. cracked me up. And it was anyway, DeSantis against uh, Gavin. So that's such a shame. Is. What's going on out there? You don't yeah. come over. I don't go to Orlando and say it's such a shame how much Disney you got over here because it is a shame. <laughs> it's a shame. It's too much Disney for one town. Anyway, Just Larry, say, thank you very much. All right, man. Good to see you. Do it again soon. See everyone.